Hi, everybody. I see that some of you guys are on. We are just waiting for Dr. McMakin, our famous co-host, to arrive. Her computer decided to update right before they logged on. So she's going to be a few minutes late. I would like to say something before we get caught up in all of our stories and all of our great advice that we try to get at you. The FSM sports courses are updated now on the website. So you could go to frequencyspecific.com and go to sports and you could see when the sports courses are going to be. We also have updated the online FSM sports courses. So only for those of you who are in physical medicine and have taken some FSM training already, that module will be uh, available for you to do online. So you could head over to that website or to fsmsports365.com. And you can apply to take the seminars that way as well. Right now, I still am being a little specific with who I let take those courses online. Those of you who have taken the sports courses know how much practicums and how much hands-on work there is. But I do understand those of you who are in Europe or who can't travel, and I want to help accommodate those people as much as possible. So there is that option for everybody. I will also be live In California in August, we're doing the first hybrid. So those of you who have taken the FSM sports course online can do a one-day hybrid, and you can do all the practicums with me here in California, and that is August, I should check, I think it's the 5th or so, and then we're going to do the sports advanced also. So that will be in California the first weekend in August. I will be live in Portland at the beautiful Troutdale Clinic. And that will be right after the core in November. So late November, we will be there. Please help spread the message of Frequency Specific Microcurrent by clicking on the like button. You can subscribe to us on YouTube or any podcast app. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments. You can find the podcast transcription at frequencyspecific.com as well as more information about Frequency Specific Microcurrent. So that's the update on my end that I can talk about before we see Carol. And I think the last update was still waiting. I'll bring her on my computer once she is in here. Perfect. Hi, Kevin. Yeah, no, her, her computer is still updating. That's what happened. But she, <laughs> she hasn't even gotten in here yet. That's okay. It's funny. My computer, my charger is in my clinic. I raced out this morning without it. If I die on this computer, I have my phone ready to rejoin. If I die, that's what happens. Your computer just restarted. It's been updating this whole time. Yeah. You might have to come on to my computer. We can do a little switcheroo. Looks good. Hi. Hi. I just decided to jump on and give all the updates, all the things that I never get to say when we start talking together. So it's just the new sports courses for the rest of the year, where they're going to be. So I can't wait to do it in Troutdale right after the core in November. Oh, in November, it's a two-day practicum. Right. So that's even that's better. That's what it's after. Yeah, it's after your practicum. And then we'll do the sports right after. That which would is be- like a two-day practicum. So it's like a four-day practicum for those people who do both. Oh, that is actually perfect. Take the core. Yeah. Maybe we should do that kind of every time we do a two-day core. You could try it. If you have time. I think so. Otherwise calm and unscheduled life. (laughs) The summer is actually a great time. I have so much to talk about summertime things, but I think there's so many practitioners that I've spoken to in the last little while and everybody loves to get their CEUs scheduled in the summer because their brain actually has some time to think about what kind of CEUs they want to take or what kind of courses inspire them. So The fall courses seem to be busy because of that. Everybody gets inspired over the summer and then they come to us in the fall and the winter time. Then they can sign up with you when they're inspired in the summer. Yes. And I get inspired about the advanced already. The dogs are, the lab is a little stressed today. There's some construction across the street. So he hears some trucks. So I let the door open so people can go in and out. Oh, Uh, people and a dog. He just needs to be able to. They're fur persons. They are. And I hope your fur person is doing better. That was the cutest picture yesterday. Yes. I I mean. Yeah. No, she's doing better. She slept off the anesthesia, the sprain in her 
SI joint healed okay. and she is now harassing the cats and the other dogs and destroying. She likes disemboweling for stuff, fluff stuffed toys. So do both of mine. And once all the fluff is out, then they're done. Yeah, that's okay. The animal is dead. I am the king. Good and, job. Killed it. Yeah. And then sometimes she starts to eat the fluff, which is a little too barbaric for me. So that's when we get to tidy up the floor. It's right. cool. This was a week. I did a thing. No. I finished last night at 10 o'clock. On a patient, I started at four because I sent her for x-rays at 2.30 because her MRI from last week showed a huge disc bulge that's touching the spinal cord. And so I said, we need these x-rays to find out if it's stable. If it's stable, we've got six months to get it repaired. If it's not stable, when you get home, you get to talk to an, a nice neurosurgeon after eliminating all of the not nice neurosurgeons. And so she got back from x-rays and I'm working on the usual things. She had the Tarlov cysts. Okay. She's the one. Yes. She's the one. For people who forgot what those were, can you explain? <laughs> it's, it, yes. I had to look it up to Good. find out the details. Because I forgot even from what last week. Yeah. So Tarlov cysts, they can happen any place in the spine, but the place they get most difficult is in the sacrum. So it's a place where finally, several layers down in the research, I found out that it's a place where the arachnoid, so nerves as they exit the spine are covered with dura. The middle layer of the dura is the arachnoid. The arachnoid has as its job to absorb spinal fluid. For whatever reason, usually trauma, the arachnoid gets scarred down to the nerve. Then it can't absorb appropriately. And it's like having hair on the drain. So the fluid builds up around the nerve inside the dural sheath and compresses the nerve and causes a feeling of fullness, sometimes pain, sometimes in her case, motor dysfunction in the bladder because motor to the bladder is the S3 nerve root. If you ever want to be completely impressed and a little bit overwhelmed by the nervous system, look up enervation to the bladder. Sensory comes from L3. Sympathetics come from T12. Parasympathetics come from the sacrum and then the vagus gets its hand in just because it's everywhere and so she already had no fullness for four days her motor to her bladder was easier so I ran the same things I'd been running all week that's automated now then I did increased secretions in the spinal cord because her right leg gets tight. She has an equivocal Binsky on the right. Her left leg has hypersensitivity from the lumbar disc. So we had one going from her low back to her foot, one running disc repair on her neck, one running disc repair on her abdomen. And then she said, oh yeah, ever since I had COVID twice, they have blood in my kidneys and I just don't want to talk to them. It's like, okay, COVID does that. Mm -hmm. So I ran COVID in the kidneys and her quadratus lumborum, which sits right behind the kidneys, turned to pudding. And the virus frequencies that usually run two to four minutes so it's 38, 41, 44, 56, 160, 189. Those are the viruses. 56 ran for almost 40 minutes in the kidneys. Then she said, yeah, it bothers my stomach too. So I moved down from the kidneys to the small intestine with COVID. 
And then I felt something strange. She said, yeah, that's tender. It was her sigmoid colon on the left. I felt next to the pelvis where there should be something that feels like a sausage tube filled with oatmeal. That is your sigmoid colon laying right next to her pelvis. It wasn't there. It wasn't there. And I felt over and it was about six centimeters from the pelvis to the midline where her sigmoid was. And I said, do you get ovarian cysts? And she said, oh yeah, I used to have them all the time. 8.30, when I thought we were done, I started on scarring in the sigmoid, the ovary, the tube, and the sigmoid was actually glued to her bladder. So it rolled midline, mm -hmm. glued to the ovary, and then rolled over and just sat on top of her bladder. As the sigmoid moves back where it belongs, she remembers that when she had a cystoscopy, they went in to find out what was wrong with her bladder. The doctor said, gee, there's something sitting on your bladder. It's not the normal shape, but it's not cancer, so it's fine. It was her sigmoid colon sitting on top of her bladder, making it smaller. And then the Tarlev cyst made it harder to empty. The last three nights she was here, she slept through the night without having to get up and go to the toilet for the first time in years because her bladder was normal size and the motor nerves from her sacrum were working in such a way that it emptied her bladder. So she gets up with normal sensation at C7, okay. normal sensation in her left leg, no abdominal pain. And then she's the one that had been anxious ever since she was nine years old and somebody put in 12 mercury fillings all in one day. So I ran the frequency and the constitutional type, those of you that have been to the advanced, constitutional type 55, her grandmother was bipolar and then she had all these mercury fillings. So I ran 55 and 00 for the constitutional type. And then when I ran 55 and 89, mercury in the midbrain, her face melted. She just, what are you doing? What is, what, is, who, what is that? Oh. The next day she came in and she said, I'm still getting used to who I am. Is it going to come back? I've been anxious since I was nine, like 41 years. And it's the, who am I now? Is it going to come back? And I said, I put it on. She bought a custom care and mercury in the brain is one of the frequencies. I said, you ever get anxious again, this is your friend. Right. And then I taught her exercises for neck and low back, which were the complete opposite of what this postural physical therapist was telling her. You're in too much extension. You should do flexion. So I showed her how to bend over with her back in extension, her butt sticking out and her head up. And she said, that's just the opposite of what that physical therapist told me. I said, well, the physical therapist probably didn't take into account that you have a cervical disc, which she didn't know about, and a lumbar disc, which she should have known about. And she does the same thing for everybody. And it's, anyway. So that was my day yesterday. I had a really good time. Didn't you just start everything off with a bang today? So let's go back. See, whenever you tell a story, I'm like 90% listening. And then 10% of me is making a to-do list of how I need to back everything up and hit some of the points that you talked about. Because you talk about it like it's this very no. lot. I went to Safeway, tomatoes were on sale. And then I got some people, like, these are all very big things. Let's go back to the imaging, right? Like imaging does really tell a story and it is so uh, important, especially when something is going off with your assessment. And I don't care what type of skills you have, everybody who touches people should have 
some skills to at least eliminate severe pathology that will say, okay, I need to take my hands off until we know what's going on. Patella reflexes were plus three with her body jumping. Okay. So it's almost a plus four. She didn't have clonus in her knees, but when you do a patella reflex and it's a plus three and crosses and her whole body jumps, that's not normal. And then one of her Babinskis, her toes went down, but her big toe went up and then down. And Bob Gribb taught me to call that an equivocal Babinski. So it's negative. Like her left foot, all the toes went down. Yeah. The right foot, the toes went down and then the big toe went up and then it went down. That's mm -hmm. a Babinski that can't make up its mind. That is equivocal. Okay. And that is a cervical MRI, period. So her. that's what really led you to, to do that? Yeah. Yeah. It is, I'm not touching your neck until we know what that looks like. Okay. And she didn't want to have x-rays. She's okay. got a thing about radiation. Okay. And it's, okay, that's fine. And then when the MRI came back, showing that the C5-6 disc is already touching the spinal cord. The six, seven touches the thecal sac, which is the dura. So she's got no millimeters between the five, six and a broad-based central disc at five, six, touching the cord. She's a five, six quad waiting to happen. Six, seven touches the thecal sac. We've got two millimeters three millimeters left at six, seven. I said, putting off the x-rays was not a problem, but my job, once I know that this disc is touching her spinal cord, is to find out if that vertebra is stable. Right. If that vertebra wiggles, then your spinal cord is at risk and we're going to have a whole nother conversation. So that's the lumbar disc is that you've got more room with a lumbar disc and a lot more time right. most of the time. So aside from you doing the reflexes and had anybody done these reflex testing tests? Like uh, she's seen her GP, a neurosurgeon, another neurosurgeon, two physical therapists. And what were her symptoms that led her to seek care initially? This feeling of fullness in her sacrum, difficulty yeah. emptying her bladder, tightness in her right leg, no pain. She's really stoic. So yeah, it hurts, but I don't like doctors. Right. And then she's been blown off for 30 years. And these symptoms are at least six years old. She had seen people that should have known. And I'm finding out that this business of hyperactive patellar reflexes, they might hear one time in four years of medical education. And they don't ever put it together. I'm a neurosurgeon. But a neurosurgeon gets paid whatever to do a 10 minute visit with you, and he makes $20,000, $35,000 for a tall up cyst surgery that has a 40% negative outcome. Wow. Like 40% are worse or wish they hadn't had the surgery. 60% are glad they had it. And that's from the patient's point of view. That's not a medical study, so I don't know. And the first thing I told her on day one is you are not having a tall up cyst surgery, period. It, no. And she got a Tarloff cyst from tearing her SI joint, which also nobody diagnosed. Okay, so that was what I was going to ask you. Who gets Tarloff cysts? How do they happen? Um... Literature says they are associated with spine trauma and connective tissue disease. Okay. She said, maybe I have Ehlers-Danlos. She had a Baton score of two. Okay. No, you might have had Ehlers-Danlos when you were nine. You're 50. You don't have earlier standouts. Okay. But with trauma, when you think of what trauma means 
when you stretch a nerve that is, that's got a sheath of the dura attached to it. The first patient I treated had tar left cistern or thoracic spine. Next two patients I saw had tar left cistern or sacrum. The mechanism for this in lady was she fell, like stepped wrong and fell on her butt with her knees flexed mm -hmm. and just sheared her SI joint. Mm -hmm. And I said, so what happened after you fell? I couldn't sit. I couldn't stand. I couldn't roll over in bed. I couldn't lay down. It was exquisitely painful. It's okay. You tore your SI joint. Mm -hmm. After three years that healed. Okay. And then the Tarlov cyst, if you think about the mechanism for her anyway, you look at where the S1 nerve root comes out between L5 and S1, goes down as part of the sciatic. The S2 nerve root comes out of the sacrum mm -hmm. and becomes the other side of the back of the leg. Mm -hmm. But S3, 4, and 5 are underneath the sacral roof. So in that little teeny space in the sacrum, and they go to your bladder, your vulva, your anus, all that stuff. And the problems with emptying her bladder, the feeling of fullness all started after this fall, but the sacrum hurt so much, she didn't pay any attention to them. Mm -hmm. Then they did an MRI of her lumbar spine showing this huge lumbar disc. And the neurosurgeon got all excited because as an incidental finding, there are these Tarlov cysts in that little bit of the sacrum you can see in a lumbar MRI. Mm -hmm. So the next neurosurgeon, this guy says, oh, we're going to do surgery on your Tarlov cysts. And she went, oh, wait, let me get back to you on that. Yeah. She goes to another neurosurgeon that says, let's take an MRI of your sacrum. And there's the Tarlov cysts. Then you look at all the symptoms when you Google it and yeah, she had that and that, but what caused it? So you Google what causes it? Trauma. Could we be more specific? Then finally, fourth search, scarring in the arachnoid. And that makes sense. You tear the SI joint, you're going to pull on the S2, 3, 4 nerve root and cause a little bit of a bleed which is going to cause scar tissue at the arachnoid. Right. And then after three sessions, the symptoms are going down, the fullness is down. And I wrote her a note yesterday, ask your GP for a repeat MRI when you get home and I will pay for it or the nonprofit will pay for it. If we just get rid of her symptoms, that's one thing. But if the Tarlov cysts are gone, that's a publishable paper. Nobody cares about patient symptoms, but they care about imaging. Is there adult beverages in that coffee? Come. Not enough. I'm just kidding. Just as I'm writing, I'm putting all this data together for this wonderful nerve pain patient that I'm working with. So I do care about her pain. Actually, she doesn't have much pain. It's numbness. So when you have a patient that has irreversible numbness and you reverse it in 20 minutes, I think that's cool. That's a thing. And then foot drop that's six years chronic. The patient goes, I can lift my foot up. You understand you couldn't do that for seven years. Yeah, but it doesn't go up quite as far as the other one. It's the talus is dislocated because your was, foot was like this. So let me use my activator and thump the talus back where it belongs. And now they go up together. Right. Okay. And she's not numb anymore. 81 and 396. 40 and 396. Yeah. And oh. then 81 and 396. Yes. I have gold stars now on strips at the clinic. And, you, and when a patient does something really good, they I take the star off and I put it on their shirt and I just put a gold star right there on your left shoulder. And I'm sure that some people think that's cute, but for me, I've always been that kid that wanted the grade. On a scale of one to 10, how great did I clean my room today? So when 
I get the gold stars. And it's funny, I had Peter Twist on in an interview, and I quoted him correctly about the neural conduction of fascia. And he's, wow, that's incredible. You get a gold star. And I was like, yes, Can you say that again for the people in the back, because Peter Twist just gave me a gold star. And I had captured that moment of the video. And just my face was just like, I don't think I smiled like that ever, but. And the nerve conduction of the fascia is twice that of the nerve, four uh, times. Seven times, actually. Seven times. Like brain nerve muscle connection, about 175 miles per hour. Brain fascial connection, over 700 miles per hour. And that's because fascia is a liquid and it's a Mm -hmm. semiconductor and it just goes right on through. Yes. And I think as we're learning more and more just about, like you said, they have the semiconductor, it's that lattice type of network. So instead of that straight, it's like lightning, instead of the straight line that comes down, it's like the instant. Yeah, it splays out. And so I think as we start doing more and more research, we're going to see those like that one percenters of professional and Olympic athletes. I think we're going to see it's that fascial innervation that gets them to, that's the X factor that nobody talks about. And nerve depolarization is AC. So there has to be depolarize, repolarize, and it slows it down. If all you're doing is nerve conduction, the fascia tells the brain where your toes are before your sensory cortex, like your cerebellum, knows where your toes are before your sensory cortex has it it doesn't even go up the spinal cord you don't have time when you're an olympic athlete and a runner it's built in the muscle memory and you train your fascia and your cerebellum to get the job done at 700 miles an hour and your nerves are going okay i'll make the muscles contract just wait okay i'm coming (laughs) you feel the poor nervous system going okay, here I come. (laughs) It feels like when I run with a group and the elite ones go and I'm like, okay, I'll see you at the finish line. Bye. You need me two miles back. Just, yeah, that's also interesting. The long COVID piece of it and the mercury piece of it, it was three hours to get her history. So tangential, so scattered so nervous about everything yeah took me an hour and a half to say would you wait a second would you fill this out and her bivss score was 46 over 18 so she had a vestibular injury nobody had told her about i said that will make you anxious and then about the third time she told me about the mercury it was like and then her grandmother was bipolar Hmm. It can't be that easy because right. you know how nervous I am about running 55 and yeah. zero zero because of the mercury thing and what the heck. And like her face melted. Right. If you listen very carefully, the patient will tell you what's wrong with them. Yeah. It started when I had 12 mercury fillings on one day. Okay. She had driven from two and a half hours from Alabama to Atlanta. So one of our practitioners who put her in a room with one custom care and had somebody check on her every 15, 20 minutes for an hour and then turned her loose. I had eight machines on her for each condition that she had. And then the one was manual for COVID in the kidneys, COVID in the small bowel, then scar tissue in the sigmoid colon, and then the exercises. And I had eight machines on her. And my chart notes were number one, number two, number three, number four, five, six, seven, eight, and just numbers. And she said, how do you remember all that? I was like, that's easy. It's what I did. Yeah. And these three were the same for the whole two hours, three hours that I treated you. Right. And I charged her $800 and she was completely ecstatic. She said, do you have any idea how much money I've wasted in 30 years 
talking to people that couldn't help me. Yeah. So those of you that are afraid to buy a second custom care and afraid to spend an extra 10 minutes or charge somebody an extra $50, recognize that you have the ability to fix what they have when nobody else has ever listened. Yeah. You are the court of last resort. You have the ability to be the answer. Just saying. Yeah. And I think sometimes we feel, I don't want to say bad, but sometimes we're so used to a certain pay scale and time frame that we work with patients and working with FSM really does blur the lines. I know certain patients, I'm always going to need an hour and a half. I know, and that's just what it's going to take. And I don't feel bad about charging them more for that. That's just their condition, their lifestyle, what they're going to need. They're going to need a lot of corrective exercise in the middle. And then we're going to have to get them back on the table. And then we have to fin it. Like, it's just how it presents all the time. If you have to see three people an hour, yeah. number one, you either run late which they always used to do, or you book hour-long slots and you figure out what your overhead is, what do you need to produce in a day to pay your overhead and yourself and your staff and your rent and your insurance and do the math. How much do you have to charge per hour? Balance that with what the demographic will bear. How many rooms do you have? Can you use a room to cook somebody while you're doing something else? So if you have two or three rooms, you just keep all three of them full all day and you bounce back and forth and you ask people, this is what it's going to cost you for this visit. Drives me crazy. She saw a chiropractor who adjusted her four times, and then laid out a treatment program that was going to be $6,000 for, that's it, three visits a week for X number of weeks. So you can tell he went to a practice management seminar. And that's when she stopped seeing him. She canceled her Friday appointment, never went back. But they're taught that this $6,000 or $10,000 that this program is what you sell. And it's no. Yeah. You give them more, solve more problems, do an exam, explain to them what they have. And because honestly, our group is the only one that knows. So in the advanced, it was to ask these questions because you have been to an FSM seminar. Mm-hmm. So anyway, so I had a very good day. I think every day is a good day when you're helping people. Even the small gains, it, they, they don't all have to be these like patient walks in with the 10 out of 10 pain and they leave with the one. They're not always like that when they are. But I think as long as you're always making an improvement in someone's life, you're doing good. And who would have get she literally in four years since COVID hit, she is the only one who mentioned casually, I have blood in my urine. Blood in the urine comes from the kidneys, just in case anybody's wondering. Blood in the urine comes from the kidneys, unless you have hemorrhagic cystitis, which means you've got the most vicious kind of bladder infection. You've got a lot of pain. You know it's coming from your bladder. But if somebody does a urine dip and you've got red blood cells, that's coming from your kidneys. I've never run COVID frequencies in the kidneys while I had my hand on somebody's arm or my hand on somebody's back. And I get to 56, which usually runs about five minutes and it wouldn't stop smushing. So I got bored and I moved to another frequency and it firmed up and I went, you've got to be kidding me, 56 smush. So I went over and I started programming her custom care lost track of time. So 20 minutes goes by. I go back and feel her arm and it's still going smush. You've got to be kidding me. Went to 160, firmed up, back to 56, smush program. 
back to check. And so that one visit was almost $3,300 because she bought a custom care and the leads and wraps. And she was ecstatic. She has answers. Yeah. I think having answers is part of it, but I think having a plan and having control and taking some power back is the other component of it because the patients that have been on this journey, trying to find answers, seeing different practitioners, getting different stories, not being listened to and not being asked the right questions to begin with. That That's a pretty bleak place to be in. So when you do see somebody that A, asks the right questions, understands you, listens to you, doesn't freak out, can do something about it and gives you a plan to help you, I get that. Like that is to make it applicable to my life or to physical medicine. It's like treating a runner that has been told you need to stop running. And maybe eventually, but you want to give that patient and within reason a plan to say, okay, you're not going to be able to run the way that you did because you have this and this, we're going to correct this and this. We're going to cut back on your mileage, but we're going to build you out a plan and you're going to come see me in between it. And here's a machine to help you right after you run so we can control the inflammation. That's the better delivery. Yeah. And she had pain between her big toe and her second toe. And she said, I think I have a Martin's neuroma. And I went, okay, what happened to your foot? She said, I thought I broke it. And they said, oh, I might have a fracture, but it wasn't, they took an x-ray. It wasn't really fractured, but, and I felt down and you could feel the crack. I said, you had a stress fracture and they bleed. So one day I ran 40 and 396 and then scarring in the nerve and squished it, scarring in the periosteum and peeled that away. And it was done. She went out and bought a new pair of shoes. My foot doesn't hurt. Okay. It's just not that hard. <laughs> Again, when you, when you ask the right questions and you can get a clearer picture. Again, like we're always asking what the driver is. Like, how did we really get here? Yeah. And I'm not even going to say, how did we get here? But how did we really get here? Because patients sometimes do have it, have the story in their head of what they think happened that led them to where they are. And it's taking that story and being like, okay, hey, maybe, but what else happened? So, and then yeah. doing your own investigation. That was so much fun. So I, I had told Kevin as it was really funny as your computer was updating and trying to come online, I raced out of the clinic this morning without my power cord um, for this laptop. So I have my phone ready to jump back on um, in case I die because I have 7% left on my computer right now. Uh -oh. What time is it? 20 <laughs> minutes. 7% is. It could be a minute. It could be 20. Yes. And it keeps saying you might want to plug in your PC. I know, smarty pants. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. But it's funny that you're talking a little bit about, about COVID. And yes, Louise, we see the questions. We have so much to unpack. So maybe we'll jump into the... Actually, I'm going to leave the question for a second in case I go away for a minute, then you can answer the questions as I'm booting back up because I, I do want to talk about something. Oh, okay. Can I got you... noise. Okay. No. So like I said, it'd be a good thing if you could do that in case I have to come back on for a few minutes. So with COVID, and I know a lot of people don't want to say the C word, they don't want to talk about COVID or long COVID and it's neither here nor there. But with me and the demographic that I'm seeing, a ton of runners, a ton of triathletes, I am seeing a lot of people that all of a sudden have asthmatic type conditions. And yes, it's California. And yes, there is, we were, we're having a terrible allergy season right now. So we are seeing a lot of reactive airway, but it's really funny because I do firmly believe the universe gives us patience to teach us things. Mm -hmm. And in my case, it was, I was learning from getting treatment last year in Kona with my ribs because you right. did my ribs and I hadn't even thought about asthma and I had it when I was like 11 or 12 and haven't had any condition since, 
But since you released that, and that was one treatment, I run completely different. And I was videotaping myself because I'm doing this running analysis. And I swing so much more. I have so much more movement in my rib cage now since and again, it goes back to why did my L4, L5 look the way that it did? It's because nothing moved and there was just all that shear going down onto that one segment. Sure. So you do one treatment, you free up the entire thoracic cage, and then you create movement and space where there never was before. And so that the people that say you have to stop running with because of that disc. No, I bet you if I had more imaging done, that disc would be fluffy because the torque is completely different. Sure. It's sure. the whole jelly donut. It is. And you have to rotate someplace. Yes. So inability to move your thoracic spine and naturally the L5S1 disc gets stiffer first because it's had the most compression put on it so it's reinforced itself so something has to rotate so you're going to end up with an l3 disc right that's just mechanics right so how do you fix the l3 disc get your chest to move exactly and so with these people that are like these new asthmatics because they have either scarring from covid okay. Or all the other things. So the, the treatment that we're looking at is it's changing the mechanics. Oh, okay. <laughs> there we go. Computer finally died. So Louise, we're going to wait till Kim gets her phone locking. My son has a friend, 28 years old, who got hit by a semi truck while driving his bicycle. He has his right leg from above the knee amputated. He walks with a prosthesis. For the past three years, he suffers from extreme phantom pain. Let me finish with the extreme phantom limb pain. Yeah, I want to hear it. So Louise, um, phantom limb pain is 40 and 89. There's this one slide on it in the core. It's in the neurologic se section. You run 40 and 89 with a contact at the neck and the leg. It isn't even a group. You just run 40 and 89 because when you cut the nerve as you amputate the leg, the brain has a place for that nerve in the thalamus actually has a place for that nerve. And since there's no nerve input, it starts humming to itself. So just mm -hmm. 40 and 89. And then Christmas tree around the neck bumblebee around the stump you run one machine on 40 and 89 that'll take away the phantom limb pain then once the phantom limb pain is gone his stump won't be numb anymore and he'll be able to feel how beat up the fleshy pad is so they amputate the bone but then they leave enough flesh down to where the knee used to be they wrap it around and they put stitches on it. They're not always tidy, depending on what kind of risk there is for him to bleed to death. It, it's all on that slide. It's scarring in the nerve, scarring in the fascia, 284, deep old bruise in the blood supply, the muscle, inflammation in the periosteum, inflammation. So you have a second machine where you're running those on the stump because the stump gets beat up. Regular prosthesis for a 28-year-old without military benefits or ridiculous insurance. Inexpensive prostheses are inexpensive. They're about eight or 10 grand, are heavy and they don't fit perfectly. So he has a sock that he wears to protect himself from the prosthesis, but the phantom limb pain has never failed. I'm up to not quite double digits. 40 and 89, period. Neck to stump. And then just wait. The pain starts to go down in about 10 to 15 minutes. And then it's gone, has always been gone at 30 to 45 minutes. And then you can start working on the stump. I really have to get something published because it's easy. 
it's never not worked. So if you can keep track, take pictures, get a visual analog score when he walks in the door and a visual analog scale, and then tell him to contact you when it wears off. You don't know how long it's gonna last and you don't know how long it's gonna last, but I will put you in a chair in my office if I have to, because this is easy. I don't have to be in the room for this to go away. Mm -hmm. Walk in, you sit in my guest chair in my office, we'll hook you up. When you're out of pain, you take the leads off and you leave. Okay, that's a deal. What did I run on Kim's thoracics? It all started because we were getting rid of adhesions between the kidneys. You're welcome. Getting rid of adhesions between the kidneys and the QL weaves into the back of the diaphragm. So we got the kidneys and the QL loose, but then I went up and palpated her chest and your ribs are supposed to give and yours were like a brick. They were just stiff. And it was stiff enough that I asked, did you ever have asthma? When you have asthma, there's a lot of inflammation. So I ran scarring in the pleura, scarring in the intercostal nerves. So if you haven't expanded your chest, the amazing thing to me is that you've been running using only your scalenes to lift your ribs. And this is what I want to go back to, which kind of led me to the COVID asthma patients, but I'll let you continue with this. And yeah, I'd like to say I never had pain or discomfort in my chest or thoracics. I have been complaining of left-sided SI pain. However, everything was on anterior right. Continue. Left <clears throat> SI pain, if you think about it, the QLs attached to the top of the ileum. Yeah. And her left QLs were like a brick. So they're short, which means the psoas on the left is going to be short, which means the pain is going to show up in the right SI joint that has to move too much because the left one doesn't move. And this girl's mm -hmm. going to run. Yeah. So the SI is just okay. Then the intercostals nerves run in between each rib. So you do scarring on the nerve. Well, what are they glued to? They're glued to the blood supply, scarring on the arteries. What do they attach to? Periosteum in the ribs. And we just ran contact down the spine, contact down the front. And we did the thing with the ribs and got them all like up into your armpit, even to T1. Yeah. And until the ribs rocked. And then we had you inhale and your chest expanded, but not as much as it should. Mm -hmm. So did fibrosis. Asthma yeah. is inflammation in the bronchi and the trachea. Mm -hmm. So you, inflammation leads to fibrosis. So we did 51 fibrosis and scarring in the bronchi and had you inhale to relieve the soft tissue constriction in the bronchi and the trachea, then your ribs would expand because the bronchi would let them. Right. The cerebellum doesn't tell you why it's not expanding your ribs all the way. You don't need to know. Right. It's just protecting your bronchi. Right. So the part of it that I thought was helpful was you had to put hands on my ribs and almost guide, it's like, fill your breath into my hands this way. Because like you just said, with the SI joint, athletes are going to find a way to do something. They're going to run through injury. The new asthmatics from whether it's from COVID or allergies, how, however, they're trying to frame it. When you have that cough clearing, if you have that restricted airway, when you're breathing, like you said, those intercostals aren't going to move the ribs. So you're going to get different types of breathing. You're going to get scalenes, sternocleidomastoid, trapezius, subclavius, all these other accessory breathing muscles are going to come in as the primary because that person's going to run. So you're going to see the dysfunction show up in, in different ways. And when you remove the pathology, especially if it's been there for a little while, I had no idea how to not breathe 
the way I had been breathing, like a fish with gills, right? <laughs> that, yeah. That's really how I felt. Like I had to go into this crazy extension to get my breath in. So it's been really interesting in the last year, learning that I can actually lean forward again and breathe and my ribs are going to do what they're supposed to. The other thing I would suggest, like the follow-up to somebody that you do this to, yeah. when you do patellar reflexes and you feel for tone in the legs. Your legs are strong, but you feel for tone. Right. Because anybody that's been breathing with your scalenes, if you think of the donut analogy, if the scalenes are pulling down to lift your first rib up, yep. you're running with your head in extension. If you're running with your head in extension to protect the C5, 6, and 6, 7 disc. So yep. the next thing you do is an examination of the C-spine, all of the sensory nerves that come out of the C-spine. And at least you take cervical spine x-rays to see if that disc is thin. If the disc is really thin, then, you know, you compare reflexes, do Babinski, end up in a perfect world if MRIs were free, you do an MRI of your C-spine and make sure that disc is where it belongs and it's stable. Because there's nobody that runs for 25 years who hasn't fallen flat on their face by tripping over a stone or a curb bounced up, right? You fall, land on your knees, you whip your <clears throat> forward, then you get up and you keep running. Well, when you whip your head forward, you take the jelly donut, you squish on the front, you squish the jelly out towards the back or towards the spinal cord. And there we go. Yeah. It's, so I didn't tell you that in Hawaii because we were busy, but. No, so, but that's right. Does yes. that make sense? It does. But again, who goes there, right? If I were a normal person and I went to my primary care who would send me to PT for low back pain, I'd be on my side. Somebody would be hammering my piriformis and I'd be told to find a different activity if it doesn't go away. Because you ask the right questions, you have pattern recognition and we have you... Tool. You have a tool that allows us to look for the things that other people don't want to look for or they don't care to look for because they can't treat it anyways. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. yeah. I can't see the questions on my phone, so I'll let you oh, okay. uh, let you see if there's oh. any more um, questions Derek, or Q&A. Derek is confirming I was there and witnessed the magic in Hawaii. He was. Yeah. And everybody at the... Master class got to see Kim completely stoned. That was really fun. Um, it's terrible. It's so much fun. <laughs> and and was- got to see me run 10 miles the next day because I just couldn't stop because I was having so much fun. Yeah, exactly. And that was silly. Like I would never have somebody that I just tore everything apart and rebuilt run 10 miles. I'd say run five and go back up from there. But so speaking of patterns, mm-hmm. let's look at what we just did. Yeah. So we changed the length of the QL on the left. Yep. For follow-up. So you, people ask, why do you see him twice a week for four to six weeks? You fixed her, her left SI joint. You fixed her ribs. But yeah, the next visit, you work on the bronchi and the trachea, get her to breathe. But the visit after that, you have to work on the anterior right hip and the anterior left hip. So your left hip hasn't been able to extend because the QL is already short. It's permanently extended. So your femur hasn't been able to rock fully forward. Mm -hmm. What do you have to do? You're going to have to work on the joint capsule and the periosteum, the tendon sheaths or the bursa at the pelvis where the um, hamstrings attach posteriorly to pull the pelvis forward. Right. They've been inhibited because the pelvis is locked. If you're already posterior, hamstring strings can't pull them already more posterior. Mm-hmm. Hamstrings are like, whatever. Now you have to release the hamstrings and treat them for being torn and broken and scarred in the sciatic so you Mm -hmm. think about the body as a whole if you have time 
So you're going to go out and run. And then the brain training is actually walking toe to heel, toe heel in the office to get the information about the new position of the sacrum, the new length of the hamstrings and the new motion in the joint capsule because you just treated scarring in the joint capsule, scarring in the peri in the bursa. And you get the whole pelvis and femoral head on both sides and the sciatic nerve and the tendons. That's the next visit. That's mm -hmm. gonna take 20 minutes. Teaching them to walk takes another five. Mm -hmm. and then you turn them loose to run, you have them come back the next week. And then you take it apart from the clavicles, the SCM, treat disc repair on the C-spine, because there's honestly, just between us girls, there's no earthly way you don't have a five, six disc. It's not gonna happen. It's gotta be there. Yeah. Just because something has yeah. to. So you treat disc repair, you make sure the neck is fine. And then you treat down in the foot because if you haven't been able to anteriorly or yeah, posteriorly rotate or anteriorly rotate your left pelvis or your mm -hmm. right pelvis, mm -hmm. you have to treat the right SI joint for hypermobility and you have to treat the fascia and the nerves in the foot to increase the flexibility and you've got to make sure the talus is back where it belongs. Mm -hmm. So take all the adhesions out between the nerve, the tendon sheaths at the um, medial ankle. So you can do as much as you want to do. It depends on you. You're very competitive. You love to run marathons or half marathons. And you have a good kinesthetic sense. So you feel everything. Yeah. And you felt everything we did so far. Next time I get my hands on you, which might be Hawaii or October, we'll do the femoral head and see if it rocks. And right. we'll even up the pelvis, work down the legs for adhesions theoretically there should be adhesions between the posterior tibial nerve and the deep peroneal nerves on the left and right side of the calf on both sides down into the foot those have to be released from adhesions because they've been beat all the heck mm -hmm. and they're connected to your hip which is connected to your ribs which is connected to your neck which is connected to 40 and 89 to your brain and the cerebellum. And that's connected to your kidneys. And don't forget the scarring in the appendix, which is what started the whole thing because I couldn't lift my right leg. Oh, so you're right. I only had pain in the left SI, but right away you're like, something's happening with On your right. right hip. Yeah. <clears throat> and so we took apart the appendix first. Yes. And that's what led us. That's what led us up to the kidneys. And yeah. that's what led us to the lungs. Exactly. Because Kevin has to find a title for every podcast. This yeah. one is going to be treat what you find. Yeah. Don't be right. afraid. Treat what yeah. you find. Yeah. I took apart the scar tissue in the appendix, then the kidneys, then the ribs, because that's what I ran into with this lady yesterday. She told me what to do. Yeah. Mercury in the midbrain. Seriously? So I tried it and her face melted. COVID in the kidneys. I've never done that, but that makes sense. But it makes sense. Yeah. Long COVID in the kidneys and that went smush. Mm -hmm. Then her QLs went smush. And then her sigmoid colon wasn't where it belongs. It was mm -hmm. me. The only thing that takes a sigmoid colon medial, and you guys can be forgiven because there's only one slide on it. The thing that takes a sigmoid colon medial is scar tissue from ovarian cysts that rupture. 
get glued to the sigmoid and roll it medial until it sits on top of the bladder. How do I know right. that? Because I observed a surgery where they had to cut the adhesions between the ovary and the sigmoid with scissors because they were too dense to get a scalpel through. Wow. Yeah. And I was looking at the anatomy and it's the sigmoid was the descending colon was normal. And so that's what I found. So that's what I treated because 13 and 129 is not that hard. 129 is a sigmoid. 13 is scarring. We teased it across. Then when we ran out of room, we ran into the ovary. We did scarring in the ovary. And then there were still adhesions with the bladder. So we did scarring in the bladder. And then the sigmoid let go and just fell back where it belonged in the pelvis. And it's treat what you find. Don't be afraid. Treat what you find. And believe your hands. Plan B. And I think that's also what FSM has taught me. The ability to adapt and pivot. Yes. Flexibility of mind. Because when you do to go back with, if you do believe your hands, because that's, that is the hardest thing. I was lucky because my very first experience with FSM was instantaneous smush, which led me to what the hell? And then excuse me while I Google FSM Carol McMakin and sign up for a course <laughs> <laughs> and get on a plane and go to Austin the next week. And that that's how fast it was. Because if you do believe in your palpatory skills as a manual therapist, that is everything is my palpatory and manual therapy skills. When you feel something do what it does in a short amount of time, you have to believe it. The thing that made me sad was to find out there's a practitioner in Atlanta, and I don't know who it was, who has one custom care and whose method of treatment is to set the patient up with a custom care. I'm assuming she ran concussion protocol on somebody with a vestibular injury without removing 94 and 94, which is another conversation. Yeah. But she set her up with one custom care for an hour, unattended. That was her way of using FSM. That makes me a little crazy. It's a waste of the patient's money and time. So the patient never went back. Right. The patient decided to wait six months and come see to see me for a week. We got the MRI and I said, because of the vestibular injury, she can't remember stuff. And she's got so many things that need follow-up. I said, you are not leaving here until I describe all of this to your husband. Her mm -hmm. husband and her son got finished hiking Mount St. Helens at 7.30 last Friday. I was just finishing with my last <clears throat> and he said, thank you for staying. I said, you're from Alabama. You bought plane tickets for three people. You had three people in the hotel for a week. And then she's here for another four days. There's no way... It's irresponsible, it's wrong to not have you understand what's coming and why. Right. She needs prism glasses to be able to work as she does. She works on a computer working as a speech therapist. Okay. She does interviews with autistic and speech challenged children. And then she has to make notes either manually or on the computer and she said, when I move my eyes, I'm always afraid that I know that I'm going to lose my place. And I said, yeah, that's because your eyes bounce. So she looked for an FCOVD optometrist in Atlanta who insisted that she have vision therapy. And I said, you've had this for 41 years. Your vision therapy is not going to help. You are not allowed to do vision therapy. You need somebody that will do prism glasses. So she called around. She found somebody in Texas, in Austin, who does, they have a special department that just does prism glasses and does vestibular injuries. She said, I'll go to them. Okay. And if those prism glasses doesn't work, then you're coming here for two weeks and you're going to see Resky. Okay. Right. But now she understands and now he understands why she's such a space cadet on rainy days. 
And just think of the difference it makes to the whole family. Is that worth staying an extra half hour? Is right. that worth an extra hundred dollars to them? They have wasted tens of thousands of dollars in 30 years looking for an answer. And sometimes with FSM, we are the answer. For the phantom limb pain patient, we are the only answer. Mm -hmm. FSM is the only thing that will treat phantom limb pain the way we treat it, period. I have to get right. something published. So if you treat that phantom limb patient, take pictures, take a pain scale. I have somebody that will write up the paper. Hang on. Once we get even one paper published on phantom limb and you put it on a social media site where phantom limb patients hang out, right. guys are going to be buried with phantom limb patients because they're everywhere. <clears throat> and yeah. we're, we're the only ones. I get a little excited. As you should. I, I don't know. I don't know how much time there is. I don't know if my alarm's going to go off on my phone because- oh, It's 12 uh, minutes after- I could tell we were over <laughs> because at 407, Leaf said, wonderful as always. Oh. I think that's because we should probably be done. <laughs> I love that we get little reminders. Like normally my phone is on the alarm. That's why it turned itself off. Maybe that's what it was. Maybe it was the four o'clock mark and I was like, stop it. I'm still talking. I'm still listening. I'm still learning. But we had to go over because we had a couple glitches. You came on late and I left. So it's just normal time. It's an hour. I came <clears> on late because... I intended to sleep until 10 o'clock and instead I slept until noon. And when I don't get home until 10 30, yeah. then I eat dinner and then I don't wind down until one or two o'clock. At 1 30, when I was ready to go to sleep, I get a text message from a patient in Santa Barbara who's had surgery on her mouth. She's the one that had scar tissue in her mouth. She had surgery in her mouth and she said, my left ear hurts and the back of the roof of my mouth hurts. What do you suggest? And I went and I got that text at two o'clock in the morning. And I looked at it and freaked out because that is the middle ear. So I'm sorry, you guys, we're going to go another five minutes because the middle ear gets where the bones are get filled with fluid and the eustachian tube i don't have a gag reflex so i can get away with this the eustachian tube empties back there at mm -hmm. the back of the roof of your mouth there's an opening where the eustachian tube should empty chiropractors were taught by this 70 year old chiropractor how to find the end of the eustachian tube put your finger into it and pop it open and allow it to drain. I can't find it to save my life. But what I know is if the back of the roof of your mouth and your ear hurt, the eustachian tube is clogged because of the surgery in your mouth and there's fluid in there. And from the day the fluid is there to the day it gets infected, you have three to four days, period. Because okay. I used to sell the drug that was used, it's glycerin, and an anesthetic and an anti-inflammatory that use that's prescription. You drop it in there. The active ingredient is actually glycerin. Mm -hmm. And those are in over-the-counter drops as a carrier. The glycerin water seeks its to equalize. So glycerin is water-based, and there's water on this side, fluid. And there's glycerin on this side. So the water travels across the eardrum into the glycerin to equalize it. And that's how you get the fluid out of the middle ear. Mm. I said, I freaked out. And I said, whoa, are you taking antibiotics? No, we're using Manuka honey for the mouth. That's what the surgeon approved. I said, yeah, this isn't about your mouth. This is about, we've got to get the fluid out of your ear. You've got three days before it gets infected. If the eardrum doesn't burst and the eustachian tube doesn't drain, the next place it goes is in middle ear. If you get dizzy, you are to go to the emergency room immediately and tell them you need IV antibiotics. But lacking that, tomorrow morning, because it's I'm about to go to sleep, tomorrow morning, you go to the store and you get glycerin-based 
children's eardrops and put fill the canal with it, put cotton in, lay on the right side for three hours, sit up, replace the drops, more glycerin, drain the fluid, and take Sudafed. She got the eustachian tube to open with Sudafed. She got the fluid out with glycerin. It didn't break through. She was never dizzy and it popped. Wow. The eustachian tube opened and she still has hearing imbalance. Yeah. But that's what I went to sleep with. And that's why yeah. I slept until noon. And that's why I was late. <laughs> it all worked out. And then you had this extra little nugget of information to, to share with us. We, we all win with that. <clears throat> It's really time. It's 20 after. We've never gone this long. We haven't, but here we are. Sorry. But here we go. <laughs> okay. All right, everybody. Thanks for bearing with us and all the technology glitches, but we got it done. We got it done. And you have magic to do, people. Go to work. Yes, exactly. Off. And we'll Love see you me. next week. See you next week. Bye. Bye. The Frequency Specific Microcurrent Podcast has been produced by Frequency Specific Seminars for entertainment, educational, and information purposes only. The information and opinion provided in the podcast are not medical advice, do not create any type of doctor-patient relationship, and unless expressly stated, do not reflect the opinions of its affiliates, subsidiaries, or sponsors, or the hosts, or any of the podcast guests or affiliated professional organizations. No person should act or refrain from acting on the basis of the content provided in any podcast without first seeking appropriate medical advice and counseling. No information provided in any podcast should be used as a substitute for personalized medical advice and counseling. FSS expressly disclaims any and all liability relating to any actions taken or not taken based on or any contents of this podcast.